I recently listened to the first episode that we actually ever did of Let's Talk Bitcoin. And one of the conversations that we had on that first episode was about whether or not it was time at the time uh, the price was $100 per Bitcoin or so to move from the Bitcoin as the primary unit that people trade to something that's smaller. Because Bitcoin, even though there are only 21 million coins that can ever be created, each of those coins is divisible. So you have the ability to to get really really granular with how you look at this currency. But the question is, does it make sense to do that yet? And so now, you know, we're here uh, and the price is up above a thousand dollars. And I think it's worth having that conversation again, guys. Do you think it's time to move away from using bitcoins as whole units or do we still have a way to go? Absolutely. I think that the current price of Bitcoin is an impediment to mainstream adoption. I don't mean to imply that people are dumb or can't do math or anything, but they see it and they get intimidated. Well, I have to divide this. Uh, how, how much is it? And it's just much easier to use something like Mbits. But actually, Adam, now there are people talking about directly switching to micro bits or even just Satoshis. OK, so if I have one Bitcoin, what does that look like in these other denominations? What does one Bitcoin look like in micros and what does it look like in nanos? And what do we even call them? Right now, we've got a really good and easy to use exchange rate because one millibit is basically a dollar. So if you have a Bitcoin, you have a thousand millibits and the current prices, that's about a dollar per millibit. Now, if you go to micro bits, that simply means you have a million per Bitcoin. And that means that each millibit has a thousand micro bits, which are worth a thousandth of a dollar. So one Bitcoin is a thousand millibits or a million micro bits. OK, so then at a thousand dollars, again, I, I went back and I listened to this episode and, and I basically said it at that point that I thought a thousand dollars was about the point where it made sense for us to make this change. Because like you said, one bit cent or point. Wait, no, it's not bit cent. It's a point. Zero, man, the, the, <laughs> See, the, I, I guess confusing. this is kind of the problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So a millibit is a dollar and that makes it a lot easier to handle. And even if it rises and a millibit is two dollars or even three dollars. Uh, uh, sorry, if it if it uh, uh, if it falls, <laughs> yeah, if it, <laughs> if it rises in value, it's confusing. <laughs> we we can keep going that way, so it's easy to grasp as a millibit. It's much harder to do as a Bitcoin. To, to Stephanie's point, the other big issue right now is that the vast majority of people I talk to who are new to Bitcoin don't understand that you can buy fractions of a Bitcoin. They think you have to buy yes. a whole Bitcoin and they can't afford that. And in fact, you don't. So you can literally go out and buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin. And so if you have a buy and hold strategy, which is a strategy I follow every Monday, I buy Bitcoin, whether the price is up, whether it's down, whether it's side Sideways, I don't care. Every Monday, <laughs> I buy Bitcoin and I buy as much as I can afford based on the spare dollars I have. And sometimes that's a whole Bitcoin when I'm doing OK or when the price is low. And sometimes it's only, you know, point one of a of a Bitcoin or point oh one of a Bitcoin. And that's fine, too, because it adds up. Shift this perception that you have to have a thousand dollars just to get in. And that's absolutely not true. To quickly address your previous point, Adam. So the price of Bitcoin is now at a uh, thousand US dollars. One US dollar equals one millibit. When the price of Bitcoin goes up another three orders of magnitude, then it's going to be a million dollars per Bitcoin. And one US dollar will equal one micro bit. Is that math right? <laughs> that, that math is correct, but uh, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin that goes up. Don't forget that the dollar is also going down. So it's all relative, but it matters how we describe these things. Like you said, Andreas, people think that you have to have a thousand dollars just to get into Bitcoin. And it's just simply not true. And I think that actually relates to the popularity of certain altcoins that really don't have a lot of infrastructure. What happens is people hear about Bitcoin and they say, oh, geez, thousand bucks for a Bitcoin. I can't afford that. I better get something less expensive. I'm going to look at Litecoin. I'm going to look at Feathercoin. I'm going to look at PPCoin. As a result, we're seeing a big altcoin rally right now, and I think this is the reason why. A Bitcoin can be divided to eight decimal points after the point. That means there are a hundred million subunits, uh, which are called Satoshis. 
So uh, one Bitcoin, 100 million Satoshis underneath that. Now, the reason this is important is because throughout the Bitcoin network and protocol, what is being transacted is in fact Satoshis, not Bitcoin. Uh, the units are always uh, expressed in integer values, not floating point values. And as integers, they're denominated in Satoshis because uh, most financial systems can take very large numbers, but they can't take um, too many points after the decimal in terms of floating point numbers. So when you transact one Bitcoin uh, on the network, it actually appears as a hundred million Satoshi transaction. What's interesting is that uh, another way to look at the exchange rate is as the purchasing power of a dollar. So right now, a dollar can buy you a hundred thousand Satoshis. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a dollar could buy you 300,000 Satoshis. So if you were paying attention, effectively, you're looking at your dollar losing purchasing power against Bitcoin. And at some point, it's going to buy you a lot less than a hundred thousand Satoshis. I would very much like to see uh, inverse tickers that instead of showing you the price in US dollars per Bitcoin, they show you the price in Satoshis per dollar. Uh, so so that you can actually see the the vanishing power of your dollar. Well, actually, there's an app called Bitcoin Paranoid that I use on my phone because I am Bitcoin paranoid about the price. And it actually shows the inverse price against the U.S. dollar. So if you pull it up, it'll say one dollar equals point nine bits or something like that. Right. It really it really needs to be in in Satoshi's because it's a lot easier to to view. But yeah, that's exactly that's exactly the point. We need to start thinking about the inverse, because after all, that also represents the fact that the dollar and other currencies are losing value, not as fast as Bitcoin is appreciating right now. But uh, the sentiment goes both ways. People are flocking to Bitcoin because it's attractive and new and different and because of all the media. But they're also escaping from national currencies for the inverse reason. Do you think people would be freaked out, though? Like if we just if we started talking about Bitcoins in terms of, wow, with one dollar, you can get uh, how many Satoshis? A hundred thousand Satoshis. A hundred thousand Satoshis. <laughs> if we started saying with one dollar, you can get a hundred thousand Satoshis. Wouldn't people start to say, hmm, I don't know, this sounds like a scam. I think it's funny money. You're playing with the accounting. I mean, the psychological stuff is so important, even though it's completely irrational, right? It's so important when we're talking about um, a new, the future of money. Yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, the best way to do this is to keep within the psychological parameters of daily spending. So if you have yeah. a currency, then buying a single inexpensive meal or a cup of coffee should cost between one and 10 units of that currency. That makes sense to people intuitively. What that says to us is that we need to go to millibits right away. If we're smart about it, we should actually even be thinking about micro bits. Otherwise, we're going to run into the same problem next year. The uh, Bitcoin QT client has had built into it for a while. There's a little box you can check that says show the prices in millibits. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it doesn't have micro bits built in yet, but that's a great point. Do we go directly to micro bits? Start talking about Bitcoins instead of whole Bitcoins as micro bits. That requires a little bit of PR and a little bit of uh, people adjusting their frame of mind. Uh, and I'll say it, it was strange for me when the price was rising rapidly and during is like you, I also purchase a little bit of Bitcoin every week, uh, usually on the order of about $100 worth of Bitcoin, no matter how much the price is. And I remember, you know, a couple months ago, 100 bucks was getting me about one Bitcoin. It was really strange to look at that and see I'm only getting 0.1. Actually, I'm getting less than 0.1 this week with $100. It's just weird to adjust your frame of mind. So it does take a little while to, to sort of rebalance your attitude towards how you think about Bitcoins and their value in terms of how much some amount of Bitcoin can get you. We don't need a large centralized campaign, though, uh, although uh, we, we do have to adjust this new reality. But every one of us can change the client, whether it's a, an online wallet like blockchain.info or it's a, basically a full Satoshi client. You can change it to millibits right now today and start getting used to it. I, I did that several months ago and uh, mentally I've been operating in millibits and it's been a lot easier uh, to handle this uh, sudden increase in value because it seems more 
counterintuitive to me. So I would urge our listeners to just go and flip that setting to millibits. The bigger question is whether that should be the default setting on at least the Satoshi reference client. And that's that's a discussion that's been ongoing on the developers list now for a couple of weeks. I expect we will see some changes in the next release. Yeah, I mean, just seeing it on a daily basis seems like the best way to get accustomed to it and get used to it. Is this like the opposite of what happened in Zimbabwe with the uh, hyperinflation? It's almost like hyperdeflation. You know, we're having to adjust our units by orders of magnitude in the matter of just a few weeks. I, I wouldn't call it hyperdeflation because this is not driven by deflationary forces themselves. It's really no, being driven yeah. by adoption. So it's hyper growth of the currency's economy. That's what's happening. The Bitcoin economy is growing with leaps and bounds right now. And, and I think almost uh, $8 billion has been fueling into Bitcoin over the last six weeks. Eight billion dollars added to the Bitcoin economy and the result is the price where we are today. But yes, this is exactly the opposite of what you see in Argentina, what you see in Zimbabwe, what you see in countries that are dealing with hyperinflation. This is hyperdeflation and it leads to it leads to hoarding. And that's the other thing we need to be concerned about. Oh, well, that's a big philosophical question, because what's the difference between hoarding and saving? Well, it depends on whether you're a Fortune 500 consumer-oriented corporation or a saver. <laughs> you call it hoarding if they're not buying your product, basically. I think that this is actually a myth that, I don't know, I feel like we're going to bust over time because, again, this is one of those personal statements. I think that I've never had a problem with the currency being deflationary. You know, I've had a lot of different income levels in my life, and the times when I've been most willing to spend are the times when I felt like I was most able to spend because I had already, I was confident in my financials. So as the value of Bitcoin goes up, I think that there are a lot of people out there who are holding it, who are now more comfortable spending it than they were when it was worth less because they have more. I mean, right? Unless they expect it to rise another tenfold or a hundredfold within the next couple of years. And that's the risk. But, you know, that kind of extreme growth, uh, which comes from rapid adoption, won't last. It will last only for a couple of years. And if uh, for the beginning period of Bitcoin, it becomes really a deflationary store of value rather than a fluid means of exchange, we're only going to see half the benefits of adopting this currency, but that's OK, because then the rest will follow once it stabilizes in terms of growth. So I'm curious, um, have either of you, since the price has gone up to over a thousand dollars, made purchases within the Bitcoin economy? Yes, absolutely. I continue to pay contractors, buy services, buy products. But but what I am doing increasingly is whenever I can, if I do have to make a purchase in Bitcoin, I try to immediately do a dollar to Bitcoin conversion to keep my Bitcoin reserves at the level they were before. So I'm reluctant to reduce my Bitcoin reserves. I am hoarding a bit, but I'm doing that by essentially buying more while I'm spending it, not by stopping the spending. That's basically what I'm doing too, Andreas. It's really interesting that you should mention that because yeah, like as the price has gone up, I didn't, it didn't used to be that I would replace the Bitcoin, but now more often than not, I'm, I'm using Bitcoin to spend it for the discount I'm able to achieve by doing that and then buying the Bitcoin back through, through my normal means and actually uh, saving a bit on that, but not actually having the reduction in my Bitcoin holdings. That, that's an interesting point. Something else different, something has changed for me in the last couple of months. I've gone from about uh, 10% of my income being Bitcoin to about 30% of my income being Bitcoin last month. And by the end of this month, 75% of my income will be Bitcoin by January, 100%. So I am basically not making dollars anymore. I will be making all of my income in Bitcoin as of next month. That is a really radical change for me. It puts me 100% in the Bitcoin economy on both ends. Uh, and that I think will change my hoarding behavior. If I'm able to earn it in Bitcoin, uh, then I'll be less reluctant to spend it. And, and who knows if I'll have any surplus US dollars. I may end up not having any at all soon. I'm with both of you guys in uh, my purchasing habits. I tend to replace the Bitcoin as soon as I spend it too, because I don't want to decrease my reserves. And now what you just said, Andreas, made me think of, uh, there's a famous book called... You mean Your Money or Your Life by Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez. 
Basically, the concept of intensive saving. Joe grew up uh, in kind of a poor neighborhood. He was from New York City. And what he did was have a high paying job. He saved 75 percent of his income or even more like some people do intensive saving with 90 percent of their income if they can. And what you do is you just kind of live like a student or a very simple lifestyle for a couple of years, even though you have a high paying job and save most of the money. And over time, you're getting a return because you've invested your savings into assets that grow over time. Pretty soon you can retire after, you know, some people say the formula is if you save 75% of your income, you can retire after about eight years of, of working this way and doing this. So it's definitely a strategy that people use to uh, attain financial freedom. You know, with Bitcoin, it's if you're making 75% of your income in Bitcoin and the way that you treat Bitcoin is to treat it as though it's a savings account or a, a, something that you're saving and that you're not really dipping into, you're effectively doing that. Uh, yeah, well, I, I won't be able to do that for very long. You know, I still have expenses and I'll have to either dip or find ways uh, to source dollars separately or I'll have to convert. My landlord will not take Bitcoin for rent. Uh, but even if they did, not I, yet. I'd, I'd have to spend. <laughs> yes, not yet. I would have to spend some Bitcoin to do that. Here's the other calculation I recently made. Just a few weeks ago, I purchased a motorcycle. And so that was that's a fairly large expense for me. It's a one off expense and it's not something that I had planned and saved for. And so one of the questions in my mind was, do I buy with Bitcoin, essentially converting Bitcoin to dollars to pay for this? I could I could have paid for it 100 percent cash to purchase it or do I finance it? And I looked at the finance deals and, and basically for U.S. dollars, I could finance it at less than five percent a year over 60 months. And meanwhile, my Bitcoin return is currently 5,000% a year. So it would be absolutely foolish for me to spend Bitcoin when I can finance something at a very low percentage rate on US dollars that don't really give me any return. So essentially, I get a much better rate of return in my Bitcoin and I finance with US dollars. And I made that choice not to purchase with Bitcoin, but instead to do financing. So I, I think you're going to see that as well. It's, oh, it's yeah. currency arbitrage. At this point, what makes sense to do? And this is funny because people haven't really had these incentives, I think, in, in the lifetimes of, of people who are our age. What makes sense to do now is to take out a line of credit and buy Bitcoins and then a year later, you know, sell 10 percent of them and pay back the loan or something like that. Right. <laughs> it's incredibly risky to do that, of course. Yes, um, absolutely. But, but I know actually, people who did it last year and they're looking pretty good right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I actually have a similar story on this vein. You know, so I've been I have a, a kind of poor Internet connection out here, which sometimes causes problems for the quality of the recordings. So I'm kind of I have very limited options as far as Internet access is concerned. And one of the things that I do have access to potentially is a dedicated T1 line. But the only way that I can do that is by essentially committing to a three year long uh, lease that will run about twenty thousand dollars. So I was thinking about this because I, 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 I need the connection at this point because the instability is causing real problems with trying to record the show. But what if I took that $20,000, set it aside right now and put most of it into Bitcoin and then, you know, paid the first few months uh, out of the dollar reserve and then essentially just started selling Bitcoin with a couple of month lead time in order to pay for it. And I wonder if by the end of that, again, if we are on this deflationary trend, then I should wind up with more money at the end of this than I wind up with that I put into it at the beginning and I still get the service. It's even better if you don't have to start paying it back until if it's six months interest free or whatever, you know. Right. Right, exactly. But I mean, like, there are all of these, like, it seems like there should be companies that are offering this. They're like enabling this and letting it so that you can, you know, put, I, I don't know. It just, it feels like this is an area that hasn't been developed at all. And there's so much room that could be done to develop it. But I, I want to tie back around to, to our conversation because we've really gotten off the rails here. As far as how we look at Bitcoins, whether they be one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin or one Bitcoin is a thousand millibitcoins or one Bitcoin is a hundred million uh, Satoshis, right? A hundred million? 
Yep. Okay, 100 million Satoshis. Is it appropriate now for a show like Let's Talk Bitcoin to start looking at Bitcoins as milli Bitcoins, or should we go to nano Bitcoins? Because I mean, I think that by the end of the year... No, there are no nano Bitcoins. There's micro Bitcoins, but nano would be 0.1 Satoshis. I'm sorry. Yes, nano Bitcoins. I'm terrible with this vernacular. My God, I'm so bad at <laughs> I think at everybody is. It's, <laughs> it, it's almost as if it's all Greek to you. <laughs> Dude, so, I, I, don't, I don't know what we do about that, but it feels like, you know, it feels like the way that this is going to happen is by shows like Let's Talk Bitcoin that actually have a decent amount of reach into the space to kind of making this decision and then starting to have us talk about it in a way where that's the normal thing. And that's how it'll get to be normal for other people. So do we think that if a thousand dollars is the new normal is now the time? Yeah, it's a plateau and we should switch to millibits in our discussions right now. The alternative is to do some kind of imperial unit where each Bitcoin has 12 farthings and each one of those has 60 shillings. No, never mind. Let's so the peak scrap of efficiency. that. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I, I think I'm I'm down with that too. Uh, I think the Milla Bitcoins makes makes sense for me, and uh, maybe that'll increase our our donations. Man, we should talk about donations at some point. We haven't even talked about that in like thirty episodes. Oh yeah, maybe people could send us a few millibits or one millibit. We would really appreciate it. Yeah, that's actually been a really interesting thing. Let me just mention that real quick. Um, so again, like Bitcoin. If you have a short term time frame, it's really, really volatile. But if you have a long time frame, then it's not so much. So one of the really interesting things is that the, the common amount of Bitcoin donations that we receive on a, you know, per person basis has fluctuated from it, it started off at about 0.01 and uh, then went down to 0.07. It took me a long time to figure out why that was. I think it was $140 for a while there. Whatever the no- price it was, that was about a dollar. And so now the average amount that we're getting is like 0.002 or 0.001. But I'm actually really okay with that because those tips that we got in the first days that were 0.0 one are now worth what uh, 10 bucks each I mean like again like the the multiplier here is so good that if we don't need to spend it that I mean it's just it's so worth it so even if you're like talking about donating a very small amount you know the only real consideration as far as I'm concerned as to whether or not it's worth your time to do it for us is yes it is but if the if the transaction fee is large so I mean that's the thing is I think that the transaction fee issue is really going to be forced by this price increase I think that there has to be an adjustment coming to that with 0.9 because they can't not at this point. It's very expensive. The other day I went to see if I could edit a wiki page on like the Bitcoin wiki. It was about um, something like merchants who accept Bitcoin. And in order to do that, you had to, as an anti-spam mechanism, they use this thing called Bitcoin Verify or something like that, where you send a small amount, ostensibly, of Bitcoin to an address to prove that you're a human <laughs> being. Well, the small amount that they wanted was 0.01. And yeah, like back in the day, that was a small amount, but it's not anymore. It's 10 bucks just so you can edit a wiki. So I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. Uh, you know, and that was something else that uh, it really... <laughs> It's hard to price in Bitcoin. I just had this conversation with one of the editors that we work with. He, we've been basically updating the price as the price has been going down and it started at 0.5 Bitcoin. And then we went to point when that was like 50 bucks. And then we went to 0.25 and then 0.125 and it, it kept getting lower. And so we finally just agreed on just a US dollar price at about a hundred dollars per episode worth of material, which is a great price incidentally paid in Bitcoin. But yeah, I mean, like, it's just really crazy right now trying to do commerce, trying to conduct business on anything other than a right now. Okay, I can see the prices that we're making the exchange right this second. You know, those those exchanges are still easy, but anything that has any sort of time element to it is really crazy. I just don't think we're there at the point until we get a little bit more stability where people can price their goods and services in Bitcoin yet. I want that to be true. You know, like I've been wanting to price my voiceover services in Bitcoin for the longest time, but it just it's not practical yet. Yeah. And it costs you customers is the other thing. I mean, it makes it more mm. confusing. I think in the new year, let's uh, let's make that adjustment. And from, you know, from January 1st on, let's aim to talk about this uh, in the middle of Bitcoin sense, so long as we stay above a thousand dollars per Bitcoin. Right. Mm, so by the new that, year, we might be using micro bits. <laughs> yeah. Does that mean the show changes its name to Let's Talk Milli Bitcoin? No, it means we've become a much more exclusive and expensive brand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when you shop with Bitcoin on Gift, you can get gift cards from over 200 retailers. Think of the possibilities. Not only is your holiday shopping taken care of in a snap, from your Android device or on the web. But now, 
you have a way to purchase everyday items from stores like Target, CVS, Gap, and GameStop using your Bitcoins. That's not even the best part. When you shop with Bitcoin on Gift, you get 3% back. Ready to shop? Visit GYFT.com today. 